I want to thank everyone for coming in on this beautiful sunny day. We're so lucky we've had such odd days this month so far. But it's a bit cold out there, too. So it's <laughs> warm in here, maybe a little bit too warm at times. But And our shop is still around, all around us today. And we did a great day on Thursday night. Thank goodness for everyone that shopped. But that's not to say you can't take time after the program to, to shop a little bit. But we're here for one big thing this afternoon, and that's to hear Charlie Abbott speak right. about his experiences here in Bowensville. I know it's going to be different than my experience and maybe yours too, so let's give him a listen. Thank you. All right. Ready? Okay. Well, I'm Charlie Abbott. Lived in Baldwinsville from 1939 to, well, almost today. Uh, life in Beeville, oh boy, it was uh, it was interesting. We had, okay, in the morning, my mother would grab the broomstick and thump on the wall, on the ceiling. Time to get up, Charles. And before that, there was that whistle at Morris Machine Works that would blow about, I think it was seven o'clock when, when the force went to work. And at night, it was about four o'clock when everybody quit. That was when you quit at Morris Machine Works. And uh, that leads me to the industrial part of Baldwinsville. <laughs> right up there, there it is. There's Morris Machine Works. It was huge. Well, it went from across from the Beeville Diner, which, and it went all the way down to almost to where uh, direct subs was today. It was a huge area. And there was smoke pouring out of the smokestack and there was, there was noise and there was trucks and everything else, just what people don't like today. And uh, it was busy and it was, they made some real big stuff. Some centrifugal pumps were filled a freight car full. Uh, but that wasn't the only thing that happened in Baldwinsville as far as industry. We had more than that. If you ever know where Paper Mill Island is, there was quite a big paper mill out there called National Cellulose and they made paper. Used the paper, uh, they made paper with the, the power, the the uh, uh, water power that ran the ran the mill, and they had we were just stretched all over Baldwinsville. They had a warehouse up there on uh, Oswego Street. They had another toilet paper place over there by where the Atlantic Fish Fry is today, and uh, <clears throat> that's all gone now. Yeah, we had, uh, of course, we had. Uh, the Jardine Bronze Foundry, which was right along the railroad tracks off of East Tennessee Street. I spent a good many days there with my dad. He was an electrical contractor at Beeville. It was a household word. If you had an electrical problem, you called Lyman Abbott, and that was any time of day or night. Uh, a few times he got called off two o'clock in the morning on Christmas Eve, but we won't talk about that. Uh, <laughs> And uh, of course, uh, I got my first kind of glimpse of the railroad over there because you could stand there in the window and watch the whole proceedings uh, on the tracks there, the switch switching going on and all like that. But then again, there was another place, the International Mill, which was about a 10-story building. And uh, it took six men and a boy to tear that down a few years ago. But that was, that was probably the most active industry on the whole railroad line and uh, they got quite a few cars shipments of wheat and they, sh they shipped out grain all by all by rail rail car. Uh, Semolina was their main product and I guess I've got most of that most of the industries covered. Now where is everything now? 60 Road. Everything moved out there. Now it's a nice clean quiet town with no noise. <laughs> And of course, no congestion either. <laughs> uh, I might say that on 60 Road, that uh, was sort of a, an early, a, it was an early industrial area because World War II came along and uh, 
they had to build, they had to make some ammunition plates, and there's the ordnance works out there. That was there in the, in the early 40s. Uh, it was way back in where the game preserve is now. And let me tell you, it was not the most ideal place to build a, a ordnance works. My dad worked out there for a, a few years, and you wore your hip boots because the water would come right in. Uh, it was the the water table was so high you could just you had to wear your hip boots to work or you'd be flooded out because the water would be about that high on the floor. He used to talk about that, <clears throat> and uh, eventually, of course, Schlitz Brewery came along and brought the property and uh, up there where it is now. Where of course Budweiser's up there on the top of the hill now, and we all know about that. Well, schools. I was really wondering about how I was going to talk about that, but I'm going to tell you about the first four years of my of my career as a school student. Uh, I had some real great teachers, and uh, they knew how to straighten you out. <laughs> they could tell you your good points and your bad points and what you had to work on. Uh, there was the first grade was Mrs. Miller. Second grade, uh, Mrs. Sanders. Third grade was Mrs. Ruth Wood. She uh, she was really a top notcher. Fourth grade, uh, Mrs. Ellison. And she had uh, she had a uh, she took us all over. She was a bird bird lover. We went uh, we went birding and we went to the. She brought us pictures and stuff like that. In fifth grade, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you, <clears throat> fifth grade was the breaking point as far as our school system. Along about 46, 47, everybody came home from the war, 46 especially, the guys were getting out of the service. And what happens when, when you have that? Well, you, go, you get married, you find a job, and you land in Baldwinsville. Well, that's nice. Uh, all of a sudden, we got a lot of people, a lot of kids coming in. Well, our school district was comprised of the Elizabeth Street School. That was the high school. The uh, old build, the old part was in the back. And, and be besides that, you had about six or seven one-room schoolhouses. Well, anyway, that had to change because we were getting crowded. How, how bad? Well, in, in the fifth grade, I think I was in three different buildings in one year. Uh, I was in the Oddfellows Temple to get on the bus. I was in the Baptist Church and somewhere else, not that I recall, but I was there holding, there were holding classes right there in, in those buildings and churches. Every, every church in Baldwinsville had classes. And they bust the kids around and, and got them back in the afternoon. Uh, at the same time, there was a little concern about things were getting a little bit too big too fast. And my dad was on the school board. Now, a little bit about him. Actually, he was one of the he was the first person in my family that went beyond high school. He went to electrical school and. Washington DC, Bliss Electric, and he was quite a firm believer in education. So when he saw this mess, he got on the school board and with a bunch of other people had to figure this thing out. I'll tell you, it was hard. Not only was there crowding, but some people couldn't see the forest from the trees. Actually, well, We've always done it this way, and we're going to keep on doing it this way. We want the one-room schoolhouses, and we like we like the, the Elizabeth Street School, but we don't need any. We don't need to centralize. We we just want to keep things the way they were. Well, that came into a big big firestorm about 1947-48, because uh, they had an election and. Uh, to vote for centralization, the district had to vote, and they got they got it in there. I don't know how close the vote was, but they had everybody out to, to vote that year. So that started the that started the process of a central school district. Well, 
I'll, I'll tell you one thing. We had one of the places I ended up in my, my uh, school in sixth grade was the bus garage. That's the bus garage that they're using now. Um, another, another, I don't know how many weeks it's there, the central uh, district's gonna have a bus garage out where the brewery is. It's interesting, that bus garage, we had a, they had trenches along the floor. So when the buses came in, finally it became a bus garage. The drippings and stuff would go down the trench. Well, Buddy and I were next door to Mrs. Sternberg's room. Uh, they were singing, Tennessee Waltz was the popular song that year, and they were singing off key. And I thought to Carl Hamlin, I said, we better go over there and help him. So we pulled, there were planks over the, and we pulled the planks up and we sort of snuck along the thing. And we popped up in Mrs. Sternberg's room and says, can we help you sing? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that was kind of an embarrassment for, for, the, for the crew. Uh, high school, let's see, fifth grade, sixth grade, I went to McNamara School for a half a year and then the bus garage. The seventh grade, I ended up back in the Elizabeth Street School. Then I had the, my junior high years there. Industrial arts. We had, in fact, we had industrial arts then. We learned to work with our hands. We built uh, little candy dishes and we, we built uh, wood, things out of wood. Where did we have industrial arts? Well, we didn't have it in the school system because it was, you know, we're still building. Uh, Morris Machine Works, uh, during the war, built some kind of a product for the war, and there was a long building on Virginia Street. It was just up the hill there. In fact, it was just about where the public library is today. And they used to, we used to have to walk from Elizabeth Street down to the, down to the building, and they had our industrial arts class there, and uh, after, after that, we walked right back up. Didn't matter whether it was rain or sh shine. We, we walked about four blocks to get there. And we enjoyed, uh, we enjoyed the experience and we learned a lot. Uh, he had uh, Mr. Glenn Hess and Mr. Bob Enders for teachers. <clears throat> and of course, they are now departed, but uh, they were great people. High school, that was, uh, that was interesting. I think 1954 was the first, 53, 54 was the first year in the new building, right. Baker. Yeah. Yep. We were the first class to graduate out of that thing in 1957. And uh, <clears throat> I, as myself, was not much athletic. I, I ran cross country, and if I was able to finish the course, that was good, because I wasn't a speedster. And uh, I bowled a little bit, and that was by, about my sports uh, acumen. But I want to tell you something interesting about the way it is today to compare it then. At that time, you played Salve, you played Liverpool, you played all the big schools. You didn't have any, any divisions like A, B, and C, or small schools and like that. You played Salve, anybody. You know, it was that it was that small, and eventually now you go, you can, you know, the different schools play different, the same enrollment kind of thing. So, one of the things I got interested in in high school, I got into radio, and I didn't know my father had done that much with radio. He never got onto it, but I saw a few things upstairs in his house, in the old farmhouse that tempted me to think that he had been experimenting with that, but he let me on my own. I got into uh, radio, 54, and amateur radio was, uh, was going pretty strong. <clears throat> and we, of course, with radio, uh, we had a lot of maybe, oh, about six or seven guys that were interested in the same thing I was. And uh, we, we started a club, <clears throat> we, whoop, we had a club, and uh, we were able to get an unoccupied space in the back of the Elizabeth Street School. We set up our antennas and our transmitters, and we had a real we had a real great uh, situation there. They trusted us enough, so if we wanted to work two o'clock in the morning, we wanted to work distance distance stations, we could. 
uh, it was it was really quite uh, quite a nice thing. <clears throat> one of the high school teachers uh, I remember, of course I remember one of my principals, was Mr. Durge. He took an interest in us. And he took an interest in everybody. <clears throat> you'd, you'd sit down there. You'd sit there. Report card day, okay. And uh, you'd have your you'd be in class. He'd come in the class, sit there, and he'd look around. Let me see your report card. And he'd look at it and says, "You better, you better bring this up." And you'd be, You're great here. You know, he was just that kind of a guy. He'd just come all right into your classroom. Look, let me see your report card and let you know, let you know he was interested. And uh, I had quite a few uh, teachers in high school that uh, you know got you got you started. I was a kid that didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, I wasn't that good at math, but uh, I knew radio theory, but I couldn't, yeah, I didn't think I wanted to get into engineering. And okay, some, a lot of people know I'm into the trains, but I had a guy on the railroad that gave me some good advice. He says, Charlie, don't go to work for the railroads, there's no future. And at that time, the railroads were petering out. The passenger trains were going, uh, the freight was declining, and not until 1970, when there was an act in Congress that changed things around, uh, the rails started coming back. So I ended up going to college and getting into the education because my family was very educationally oriented. We, uh, my dad, of course, in school and on the board and like that. And I thought maybe, I, and I was oh, when I was in my 20s, it was there was need for teachers. It was like. There was a real, real need for teachers, and so I got into that field. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the farm, uh, the farm, growing up on the farm. My dad, I guess I mentioned before in my other thing on the, on the Lackawanna, burned the candle at both ends. He was my, he, my grandfather wanted somebody to work the farm, and he stayed on the farm. And if you know where it is, Abbott's Landing, if you're familiar with that part of the territory, that was our farm. And uh, well, he started, he had milk cows. This was 45, 46, he had milk cows. And he, uh, he worked with my grandfather and uh, about 46, he looked at my grandfather over breakfast one day and says, say, and then my, uh, it's about time we decided whether we were gonna uh, get a tractor or not. And of course, my, I don't think my grandfather was too happy about that because he was a horse person. He wanted the horses, but we got the farm all H and when he started with the tractor and I learned, finally learned how to drive the thing. Uh, kind of an interesting experience because one day we came up on the up through the up the hill into the into the barn with a load of hay, and I got a little nervous and couldn't shut the tractor off in time. And we were almost going through the going through the side side wall, and my dad had presence of mind to push down the ignition switch. I'd probably been dead as hay if I hadn't gotten that happen to me. But the farm uh, the farm lasted well, I guess in the 70s. Uh, we started you know, downsizing. Uh, my dad moved up on the, in the old farmhouse and then they built a, a house next door. But uh, I learned what hard work was. Uh, baling hay, uh, filling silo, uh, gra uh, harvesting grain. At that time, in the 40s and 50s, uh, you're, you're your neighborhood was completely different. You knew everybody next door. You knew ten, eight miles down the road. You knew who it was. Uh, give you an example. We had uh, it, during harvest season. It's tough. You get weather, bad weather, and like that, and you got to get things done in a hurry. So how do you do it by when, by yourself? You just grab your neighbor there. Grab uh, grab Hover and Windsor Abbott. Grab Sam Reinhardt. Grab Harry Wagner. Who else was it? Uh, maybe Melvin's, and get them all together, and uh, get the wagons all together in one place. Get the get the harv get your harvesting uh, machine, uh, your thrasher. 
which was Foster Clark's, and he'd bring his thrasher down. We'd all get together in one place, and we'd have the thing licked in about a day. And, you know, we'd be doing 100 acres of, of grain. And then you'd do, in the fall, you'd fill silo. And that was uh, the same kind of thing. You'd uh, get everybody together, they'd come to one place, do that, and they'd move on to the next place all, all around the, the, the district there. So uh, that way a lot of things got done. It was always a lot of fun. Uh, the women, they'd make dinner. Man, you have a, you'd have a feed bag. Boy, was it. You'd have pies, and you'd have cake, and you'd have roast beef, anything you'd wanted. It was, it, was a it was kind of a community kind of thing, and they made a big dinner. Uh, it was fun. It's Phil and Silo down to Sam Reinhardt's. I used to, oh, I'd help a little bit, but I wasn't really old enough to drive or anything. He had a bunch of raccoons in a cage, and I would love to go in there and and look at those look at those raccoons and of course his wife uh i'd go in there and she she'd uh, make me something to drink or eat so i had a lot of fun with that phil and silo used to go out and get muskmelons out of the field and they'd bring them up in the silo and we'd slice them up and uh you'd uh be eating the muskmelon all of a sudden the silage would come coming down right on the top of you and uh you'd walk around and, you know, with your feet and tramp, tramp down, so you get as much in there as you could. You got up to the top, that was it. You, you were done filling silo. Uh, okay, uh, I've got pretty much everything I had here. Uh, does anybody, has anybody got any questions? Yes. Yeah. Why 60 Road? Oh, uh, somebody back there knows that. That when we when we were doing, putting together the, the program on the New York New York Road, came across the map that said New York or it said 60 Rod Road. So my speculation is that it was 60 Rod Road. Yep. Uh, I think. I mean, that's my speculation. <laughs> <laughs> and the old map right. 60 Rod Road. Right. 60 Rod right. Road. I didn't know that either. That's my speculation. The map, the old map, yeah. says 60 Rod Road. Yeah. From Tennessee to Lampson. Yeah. Right. Mm hmm. That was. But I think they did do 60 out on 60. <laughs> oh, yeah. I won't tell you what happened. What happens out there. That's that's beyond. That's, yeah, that's, that's all right. Go right ahead, everyone. No, I don't think so. We're adults. Huh? We're adults. Well, it was Parker's Paradise for a long time out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wish I could tell you more. You know, I I think I got into the the population explosion and all, and and that was really a that was really a concern. That was what changed things around in our in education was was the population explosion. Uh, it was it was something else. Uh, Kennedy Road goes to Lack you know, across parallel to Lack Kel Kel Kellogg? You know, Kellogg. Kellogg. Kellogg Road, yeah. When you go into the wildlife man management area, mm -hmm. this marshy stuff you're talking about, what's the, are there any real bodies of water in there or can you kayak it? Can you no, you no. can't kayak it, but there are ponds in there. there you might, well, you might want to, you know, if it's legal, if it's okay, you might want to. Look at that. I'm always looking for a place to put my boat in the water. Yeah. Uh, I don't want three strokes and I'm across the other shoreline. Yeah. <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever do any, much of fishing or hunting? Yeah. No, I didn't. I did fish a little fishing in a boat on the Seneca River, and all you got out of there was carp. And, uh, it's big now. Yeah. Uh, Fishing, I loved. I, I think maybe next year. I didn't even get a. I didn't even get a line in the water this year because of the weather. I guess you go and know that about spring wasn't even here hardly until June, and uh, it was terrible for that. So maybe next year we'll get in the get it in the water. Well, you, you were spending your time on the railroad. So you got to talk about that a little bit. Well. I know you've done it before, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of people I know that came that wanted to hear about the railroad. Well. The thing about the railroad, I guess, was it was uh, it was one of the better lines that went to Oswego, and uh, 
I just, for some reason, got interested in trains, and I was hanging around the railroad yards most of the time. Uh, a couple guys wished I wasn't, and I was always trying to dodge them. Frank Thompson was wanted me to kick get kick me out of there because it was well at that time it was it was you know it was one of those things you could do today between OSHA and everything else it's <laughs> you wouldn't even get near the you wouldn't even get near the tracks but. Uh, uh, it was a busy, Wallensville was a busy place because of the mill. It was, it was uh, a, a semolina plant. And semolina was macaroni, spaghetti, and all that. And uh, they had a lot of customers. And it started out, the mill actually started out in, 19, in the 1920s. It's a crazy mill. And uh, when the Depression came, you know what happened? It bought, everything bottomed out. And it, it became... Uh, abandoned, but the International Multi Foods in Buffalo bought it, and uh, they saw it as a as a good chance to expand, and they, and it did. They expanded quite a bit there in uh, in the in the town. So switching was always the the, 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 trend, the local would always switch north and south both directions, and uh, there was always a lot of work to do there. The switch list was pretty big, and they had. Uh, a lot of moves to make. So, and I got to know the railroad guys. Uh, they took an interest in me, and if, if I wasn't, you know, foolish and getting away in the wrong place, I was okay. So I learned. I learned to do a lot of things. Learned how to make out a switch list. Uh, well, the, the the flagman on the job was Bill Tig. He he. Uh, well. I guess I can tell this story. Uh, the engineer that, got, that took a liking to me was Bill Doyle. And he was a good Irishman, a good Catholic. And uh, he kind of took an interest in me. And he used to invite me up in the cab of the locomotive. And I'll tell you something about steam locomotives. When I was there, everybody wanted to get rid of them. They, they were smoky and they were, they would pollute and uh, they liked the diesels. But at, at before that, I, I really enjoyed the steam engines. And I probably rode them 362 days of the year, uh, except for Christmas, New Year's, and when I had to be home. So uh, I got to know them a little bit. and. If, in fact, I got to do a little bit about the mechanics of them. In fact, I'd grab my dad's engineering books out of the shelf and look and see how they worked and got interested in a little mechanical stuff with that. And then I got, uh, got to know the conductors and, and one guy, Dave Jesse, he took a liking to me. After the end of the day when they were done switching, he says, come on, Charlie, get over here and we'll have, a, we'll have an orange soda. Tappan and Brooks, and he, of course, bought his Lucky Strike cigarettes over there, and uh, we talk. And then day he says, "Well, he says, how'd you like to ride to Oswego?" Oh, on the on the on the train, he says, "Yeah." He says, "We'll smuggle you on board, put you in the baggage car. You can't leave. You got to stay on the baggage car." <laughs> and uh, all right, so we so what was it? Armistice Day, oh, that's Veterans Day today. Armistice Day in 1949, I think it was 49, it was the year I was in Mr. Sparrow's class in, in McNamara School. Uh, okay, I came, to, I came to the railroad crossing in the morning. It was dark and dreary and it was raining. Ugh. Okay, here I am, about 10 sandwiches in a bag. Whereas I ate like a pig, and my mother thought I was one. Um, <laughs> they ate like much. She says, get on there. Well, actually, that day, besides doing the switching, we went up to the ordinance plant. That was the old ordinance plant we were just talking about. And we back up in there and pick up cars that were loaded with machinery that was once part of the ordinance works, and uh, they were getting rid of the getting rid of the whole thing. They were selling off the uh, property as scrap and 
they were sending it over to New York or any place else in gondola cars. So we went up in there and uh, came back, and then we went on our way up to Fulton, stopped there, switched to, switched to paper company, and went to Oswego. And in Oswego, we got, uh, I got a look at some of the other engines and some of the other uh, operations up there. They had a tunnel that went from the upper part of Oswego down to the lake. I didn't get to write in that till a few years later. But uh, and like I say, I probably listened to the dispatcher on the dispatcher's phone uh, in the, in the, outside the station there. They had a dispatcher's phone, and I listened to that going on. That was Binghamton, Syracuse, and all that. So I got a good taste of it. But like I said, uh, there was no future in getting getting a job there because it was they were the trucks were a competition at that time any other questions uh, were there four tracks at that time four tracks where four going oh yes yeah you know where the yeah well now you've got one track uh let's see coming from the west to east on east genesee street oh yeah you had uh Waldron's Coal, that was called the Peck Track, that was a stub track, right by where that dance studio was. The next track was the main, and the next track was the house track, that was by the freight house. So you shoved the merchandise cars in there in the morning, the hot ones that needed to get unloaded first, and you had cars behind that for storage. Then the other side of the freight house that went across the street was the middle track. And then the last track was the back track, that went up to Tappan and Brooks Coal Trestle. And uh, where was that? Uh, Tappan and Brooks Coal Trestle was. It's where the. It's where, where, it's where it used to be the PNC store, then it was. Uh, the, where Burned Dairy is now. Where Burned Dairy is now, yeah, up, up on that part there. Uh, that's where that was. And. Uh, <laughs> they had a derail switch right there just before Genesee Street Crossing, and I don't tell you how many times they let coal cars down there. And the, you know, if the cars, if it were, the derail was was always set for for there, so that the cars would go off the track and not come down onto Genesee Street. And you know, we'd have to sometimes the cars would come down on the derail, and they'd have to spend extra time putting them back on the track, and that made, that wasn't good for the schedule very much. Uh, International Multi Food was where Northside Collision is now. Yes, sir. Okay, and then across the street from that was a cute little yellow depot, a straight train station of some kind. That, one was, that was Tampa and Brooks. That was that was Waldron's Coal. Waldron, Bill, Bill Waldron. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. 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 No, is, well, I was talking well, no, I'm saying 40, you know, why these coal companies went out of business. Okay. 46, uh, people uh, were starting to realize that there was natural gas available. We had natural gas in Beville. My dad, the first thing he did, I think, was take the coal, uh, coal uh, burning uh, system out of the furnace and convert it to gas and uh, get rid of the coal bin and everything. Sue has a map that she, I copied, and shows where all the gas wells were, quite coming up. Yeah, there were gas wells. Some are still, yep. still there. Yes, they are. Yeah, across the street from my grandfather's farm, uh, there was a gas well right at Patchett Road, right at the, mm -hmm. at the convergence there. Mm -hmm. And they had to clean it out a couple of times uh, with, uh, with a driller, drilling rig. He just had to use the bottom stomper to get the salt loose out of there so that the, the gas would flow up. <laughs> what did you do with the products that you grew on your farm? Did you ship them away or use them? Well, actually, dairy, we had to, they had to milk and 
milk farm, and oh, I don't know, maybe 40s, maybe, maybe in the 50s. And then it got to the point where my dad was so busy with electrical work that then, then my grandfather was getting to the point where he couldn't take care of it either. So they sold the, sold the dairy. And then he went to crash crops. He, rose, he, he grew wheat, soybeans, stuff like that. Cash crop. Till they finally, did, you know, we finally stopped that entirely too. <clears throat> when you go up the hill on Ellsworth Road, you see a, you see a, the well, Crooked Brook goes through there. Mm -hmm. There was a mill there, a water wheel, right. power mill. I don't. I don't know anything about that. That's that's out of my area. What was it called, Sue? What was the mill called? The mill called on um, Ellsworth. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well. oh. We had a sawmill. They ended up with a cider mill in their last milling days. They cut ice up there and stored it. They sold us. Some yeah. years ago, a mechanic worked for Nobles, and he came out and showed me two Kodak color pictures faded, but they was there. He said that was the lead of pond. Because he overheard me talking to him about Crooked Brook. Yeah, yeah. And that one winter where the snowfall was heavy and the rain was huge, we could paddle through the bridge that the churches and Baldwin Railroad went over mm -hmm. to Brooklyn. And uh, there's a picture in your book that shows the bridge being yeah. built. Mm -hmm. You reference at one point Jardines. Did you say you worked there at one point? Oh, I didn't. Oh, I didn't. I didn't work at Jardines. Okay. I was too young. My dad was electrical contractor, and he did all of Mr. Jardines' work, all his electrical work. But what did they actually make there? I don't remember. Well, oh, they made okay. Uh, they made bronze uh, fittings. And I've, I remember seeing the tags and going out, Elko, American Locomotive Works, uh, they'd send valves to them. They made valves. Uh, they, they started the whole process. Uh, they had the sand and they had the foundry right there. And they'd, make, they'd pour the mold. And uh, then they'd, the next thing would be to chop the, take the mold apart. And then they'd take the, the product that was inside, it was formed, and they take it over to the the, the cleaning room, and they had uh, grinders and polishers and everything else uh, doing that. And then the final the final inspection. Uh, my dad was to go over there at night. He had to go over there at night after after he got done with the farm to work on whatever needed to be done. He had to he had to go up in the top. Where the where the pipes were, where all the conduits were, and those blast furnaces gave out a lot of gas, and I'll tell you that sickened them. Uh, getting up there and that and those beams, it was. <laughs> I don't think OSHA would let it happen today. Uh, no, I worked at the where Burn Dairy is now with the PNC. I worked there when it was the first PNC. Yeah. <clears throat> And those workers would come in, and some of their skins were completely different colors that worked at Oh, Harry. oh yeah, that I remember. Yeah. Their skin well, it was so warm. I mean, I'd see sweat in the winter time, sweat pouring off the guy's brow from from pouring those molds. Uh, and the gas, as soon as you pour the mold, the gas would just come right out. It was, it, you know, it was one of those things that you just didn't think about then. I mean, today we've got all sorts of protection. Today. Huh? They wouldn't have lasted very long today. <laughs> no. No, we wouldn't. Well, Morris has had their own foundry, and that was a, a hellhole. Oh, yeah. well, that, that was right the corner of Virginia. Yeah, that, that was before they moved it down to Pennsylvania. Yeah, I remember, oh, well, yeah, that was a, a lot of smoke there. Of course, they had enough to blow the five o'clock whistle every day, and or the what time that was? The paper mill blew the five o'clock. Oh, they did. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. But it's uh. There was a reason for the two whistles, wasn't there, Dick? 
Pardon? Was there a reason for the two timing of the, of the whistles? Somebody uh, said that the one worked at Gould up to, or Morris's at the time, took long enough to walk past up here the firehouse, it used to be, to blow that whistle. Yeah, there's some story on it. Yeah. I'm not sure what that is, yeah. No transportation, uh, just a minute about that. Uh, don't forget the barge canal went through. Lock 24, and I could get on my bike. I could hear the, I can hear them blowing for the locks, and uh, that way, if I heard a boat, if I heard a, a tugboat blowing for the locks, I could get over there and tie on my bike to see it go through. And sometimes they they were towing these barges of scrap metal uh, behind. And you, they'd go through with the first couple, of, they put the tugboat and the first barge, and then they'd winch. They'd have two other barges still to come through, so they'd lock them through with a winch. They had a winch and a rope, and they'd pull it through, and, and then they'd let it down to the level of the other two. So that was interesting to watch. Uh, a lot of Moran tugs. Moran was a, was a household word in New York City. They're the ones that brought in the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth and all the big ocean liners down there in New York Harbor. <clears throat> Anything else? Anybody have any questions, remarks? Yeah. What and where did you teach? Cato Meridian. And what subjects? Well, I taught social studies. I taught a little reading when I was in, in elementary, the fifth, sixth grade. So, uh, of 19, uh, let's see, 1983 to 1995, 33 years. <clears throat> Boy, their football team just made it big. Yeah, they did. Yeah. In fact, their, their coach goes to our church. When did your family go to the apple orchard? The, that was my cousin. See, my grandfather and Warren and my Aunt Nancy were, were all together there, the sisters and brothers. Warren was, and Warren, okay, Homer was a son of Warren and then Windsor was a son of Homer. And that was the Apple people. Uh, we didn't do it. We, well, my, we didn't do the Apples like they did. Well, they've got the name today up there. We, uh, my dad, I think, I don't think my grandfather would have given too much money for school, uh, but he was able to sell all these plants. He sold zinnias and marigolds and all that stuff off the farm. He had signs on the, on the front of the road, zinnias, marigolds, and a lot of other stuff. And he sold a lot of stuff. I think that's how he made his money to go to college from, from uh, selling that stuff. That was a lot of it. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not a native of Baldwin Street. So when the I hear the train going through across Genesee Street, it goes up to Budweiser. That yes, that that's the only one left. And then it goes back down and it joins with the one that goes along. Um, you mean towards Syracuse? Yeah. That line goes from there, crosses over the Seneca River by the golf course, which soon will be a housing development. Uh, uh, but anyway, it goes down to Stiles. The old PNC warehouse was down there. Now it's uh, Who But Mason and a couple of other, of, of other places that they, they've, good thing that they were able to United, develop. United, United Auto. Auto. Yeah, they've gone in there and moved in, which that's a blessing. Goes across in front of the fairgrounds. Yep, oh, okay. yep, goes in front of the fairgrounds. Yeah, and then it joins up now. It used to go under. It's a funny thing. You asked me about that. It used to go under the New York Central tracks at a, at a place at Willis Avenue called SJ Tower. And it used to go right under. It's still there. Some of the, some of the brickwork and some of the foundation is still under there. It used to go right under New York Central and then it went around and then up to Geta Street, where, 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 it, where it used to be, Geta Street Yards. Funny thing about that is, in the wintertime, when the, when the snow melted, water got a little high. 
And uh, that was always a pain in the neck for the maintenance people, was, was Willis Avenue on the Lackawanna, because the water would come right up like this. Well, the steam engines could go through there with no problem, because you know, the, the cylinder chests were up here and you didn't have to worry, but you got the diesels coming through there with traction motors, the minute they hit the water, whoosh, wham, the, it, would ruin the, it would ruin the traction motors. So they had to keep the water out of there. It was still a problem down there in that area. Of course, now we have a new parking lot, which is, um, I suppose, might have eliminated a lot, maybe, uh, down and through there. It's called progress. <laughs> progress or lack of. Yeah. Anyone else have questions? Yeah, I'm willing to take anybody. Well, I think it's been very, very interesting, and we thank you very, very much. Thank you. And I personally want to thank Bob for video yeah. today because it's important for the people that cannot get out to these programs to, right. to uh, show them and have them enjoy it too. Mm -hmm. You do a great job. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. And you know you can purchase